Hello and welcome to Foreign Affairs Focus. I'm Jonathan Tepperman, Managing Editor of Foreign Affairs. It's my great pleasure to have with me today Linda Robinson. Uh, Linda is an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. She also happens to be a uh, former foreign affairs editor in a previous life. She's the author of numerous books and articles on uh, a range of subjects, especially her specialty now, Special Forces. Uh, the most recent piece for that she's done for foreign affairs is called The Future of Special Operations Beyond Killer or Capture, and that's in the forthcoming November-December issue of Foreign Affairs. Linda, thanks so much for coming in to talk to us. Um, the first question, sort of general principles, why have special operations forces become such a prominent feature of U.S. military and foreign policy in recent years? Well, the major re reason really has been the proliferation of what might be called irregular threats. Mm -hmm. um, that is the primary reason why early this uh, decade, in, in the 2000s, the Special Operations Command began expanding the number of operators because while there still are conventional state foes, enemies, adversaries of the U.S., um, even states are coming at the U.S. in asymmetric and unconventional ways. Mm -hmm. So whether it's a non-state actor like a terrorist or terrorist network or a state using unconventional means, this is really the, the skill set and what special operations are designed to get after. Mm -hmm. And so what are we talking now in terms of numbers, both sheer numbers and as a percentage of the U.S. military? Uh, the overall U.S. Special Operations Command, uniformed and civilian, is 66,000, mm -hmm. so a tiny, small percentage of the total U.S. Mm -hmm. military. The actual operators are only 33,000. Mm -hmm. So even though they've grown, doubled in size, they are actually still a very small percentage. And also their budget, if you include everything that they require, uh, it's it's uh, only 4% of mm -hmm. the defense budget, which, as you know, is billions of dollars. And you say that the numbers have doubled uh, since when? Yes, since uh, 2001. Okay. Now, you write in your piece that uh, very dramatic and telegenic operations like the raid uh, that killed Osama bin Laden create a misperception in the public among the work about the work that special operations forces do in general or should do. Can you explain that? Yes. Well, ironically, the attention has focused on these raids, uh, which uh, in some respects are the most highly classified, mm -hmm. the raid to go and get bin Laden. But that has attracted the most public attention. But raids, in fact, are really one of the more conventional uses of special operations forces. And they engage in a whole range of other activities uh, that are actually more unconventional in nature. And those might be broadly characterized as influence operations. Um, I'll give you the most prominent example there is the joining with the Afghan Northern Alliance militias after 9-11 to take down the Taliban regime. And right now they're out there with Afghan villagers. Mm -hmm. uh, in places like Colombia, they have gone in and built up uh, Colombian special forces and then worked with them jointly. So it's a whole gamut of things really involving working with whether it's tribal entities or other countries' forces, but really not just training them, mm -hmm. but operating out in the field with them. So is this the, the distinction you make in your piece between direct and indirect operations? Yes, and that's a terminology that the special operators use mm -hmm. themselves. It's a little bit opaque to outsiders, but if you think of direct as being kind of the unilateral surgical strike, mm -hmm. the going in and getting bin Laden, where it's just the operators on that helicopter going in, and these others uh, always involve some kind of indigenous partner. Mm -hmm. And it can be the populations. I mean, civil affairs units, psychological operations. So it's not just guys with guns. There's mm -hmm. a whole gamut. Mm -hmm. And would you argue that the special operations forces are better suited to the latter set of tasks than to the former? Um, what I have argued in this article is we've spent the last decade really highly 
refining the rating capacity, which make no doubt about it, we need it. It's an ab absolutely essential function. Uh, but we have not optimized or prioritized this other mode of using special operations forces. And the argument is, uh, and it really derives from the situation we're in now as a country with strapped defense budgets, strapped budgets overall, uh, but also the waning of the big wars. And we need to be able to work with those partner forces out there, official and unofficial forces, to do it with a smaller footprint and at a lower cost. So what we're really doing is leveraging others and their capabilities uh, to get this done. Now, isn't there a danger in working with foreign partners not necessarily contracting out U.S. foreign policy, but working with foreign partners to conduct missions that are in everyone's interest because of you, you can get into situations, A, like in Afghanistan, where supposedly friendly troops are fragging their American comrades, or B, as we saw in Central America in the 1980s, where U.S. trained foreign troops end up committing a whole slew of abuses that then come either create blowback or create a, a major public relations problem for the U.S. Yes, and this is a good point because it's it's very important to understand this is slow, hard work. Mm -hmm. It is not overnight delivery of perfect results. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do spend a good bit of time in the article talking about the various pitfalls and how they can be navigated. But if you're looking at a few stark options, go in with an invasion force, do nothing. Uh, and the rating, the rating application generally only achieves a partial or temporary effect as well. So what you have, in fact, Salvador is a good example. Decades later, you have a professional force that's also a good ally that's willing to send troops to Iraq, for example. Uh, Colombia is becoming a major player, not just in Latin America, but helping out in West Africa. They professionalize over time, and I don't want to minimize the um, you know, we will never have perfectly aligned interests with another country. So it's really a matter of assessing what are U.S. interests, is there enough of an alignment, and are we willing to tolerate some of the weaknesses and accept it as a work in progress? And I think that uh, Congress also has a big role to play. In Salvador, for example, we put conditions on the aid, we put limits on the number of advisors, and that was kind of a carrot and stick approach to help keep, keep that country moving down the path we wanted to go. So given that we've seen so much emphasis on direct raids in, in the last few years. In broad brush strokes, what kind of changes are you now looking for, for from Washington to enhance this more um, indirect capacity? Right. Well, the first thing is simply education, because it is astonishing, even within the policy community, how little understanding there is of this full range of special operations capabilities. And then there is very, there's an, a need for them to up their game and approach it as more of a campaign so they are able to map out what is an entire indirect campaign if you will look like and how does it integrate with the embassy country team and other members of the government because none of these types of applications are done in a vacuum sure. so you need to really work with the other members of government but I think the first task is simply educating people that this is the actual majority application of SOF. Linda Robinson thank you so much for coming to talk to Foreign Affairs. Thank you.